Well, let's open our Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 33, and I'm going to speak just on the first two points. I'm not going to bring this whole message today. I do want us to have a moment of prayer here. We need to pray, certainly, for these people in the north that have been devastated by this storm and this hurricane, and uh, we want to remember them in prayer. And uh, then Elections Tuesday, I believe, at least in my lifetime, most critical election we've ever had. So I want to just pray for God's leadership in that. And then I'm asking this. I received a phone call here on Friday. I've never had this said to me like this before. One of our ladies called, and she knows of a young lady that is four months pregnant. And uh, this really hit home with me because my daughter-in-law is just right in that four months pregnant. So the little life's in there. And on this Tuesday, this mother is planning on having this baby aborted. I don't know this lady, I've never met this lady, but I just want us to pray for her that she will not make that decision to do that. And I just think, when I think, well, it's my little granddaughter in her mother's womb, I think of this little baby, and here's that little baby, this ought to be a safe place for this little baby, and little does she know, unless things change, her own mother's going to have her life ended in two days. And that's tragic. That happens 3,000 times a day in the United States of America. It's horrible. So let's bow for prayer, please. Well, Father, there are many needs here, and we just want to call on you. It's, certainly, we want to come in here and be inspired by the music and be taught from the Word of God, and that's so very important for us. But, Father, it's to be a time of prayer. Jesus said, your, you said your house is to be a house of prayer, and so I do pray for all these needs, and I pray my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, certainly join their hearts with this. But, Lord, we do pray for the people, in, especially in Staten Island and all those places, Places where it's devastated, many have gone a long time without water and food, without electricity, without gas, and it's just so difficult for them. I pray for them. I pray for relief workers that are trying to assist them and help them. And I pray the relief workers who go will be allowed to come in there and give the assistance that they want to give. But Father, just help in those situations and let it be a reminder to all the people there and to all of us as well. I mean, things of life can happen that we do not have any control over. And it just shows, again, how desperately we need you and how desperately we need each other. And, Father, I do pray. I pray for this upcoming election, and I just pray for your guidance for the American public. And, the Lord, we, just, we ask for your will to be done in this. And, Father, I just pray that uh, hearts of America would be in tune to you. I do pray for that as they cast their votes. And Lord Jesus, I just pray for this mother that has this little child within her. And I pray somehow that you could just awaken her, whether it's right now in this moment or sometime today or tomorrow, or if even as she's walking into that doctor's office to have this procedure done, that she would stop and think that here's a life I'm fixing the end. And Father, I pray for that little baby's life, and I pray that little one will be protected. I pray that mother will not do this. So somehow, some way, Lord, just I pray you intervene in this. And I pray for all young ladies all over this country that uh, do this day in and day out. And Lord Jesus, just help those who are planning on ending the life of their child. Lord, help them. Help them to see what a travesty that is. I pray you speak to us today. Thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 21, verse 33. The Lord Jesus, in the 21st chapter, he's talking about two uh, remarkable events. One, we look back to see what happened there. The other one, we're looking forward to the future. First, he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, the disciples, when they come out, they're excited about the temples, and they say to him in verse 5 of 21, they're remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts and dedicated to God. And Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And they're asking, Well, Lord, when will that be? And then they're wanting to know about the end of time, when he's going to come back. Well, now this message that he gives here, when he talks about the fall of Jerusalem, that's not good news. That wouldn't be good news for any person living in any country of the world if the Lord gives the message that here, your capital city is going to be destroyed and uh, your country is going to be laid waste. That's a tragic thing when something like that occurs. We'd be full of remorse if we knew that. And so that was a very troubling word. His other message about the second coming, uh, his return to the earth, 
Uh, that's a mixed message. For people that don't know him, that's going to be terrifying. But for people who do know him, that is the blessed hope. And that's what we look forward to. But in the midst of all this, in verse 33, he makes a statement here that is just remarkable, to say the least. Because he says this, the 33rd verse, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Never. My words will always be here. Well, let's think, first of all, about an objection. Uh, many people would object to such a statement. I mean, I, I just uh, uh, think of different ones who would be antagonistic toward Christ. And they think, well, now, wait a second. What makes the words of Jesus Christ any different from those of, of anyone else? There have been thousands, probably millions, of philosophers, scientists, teachers, ministers through the ages. They've expressed their opinions, their words, their beliefs. And yet, I don't know of anyone that's ever stood up and made this statement. Some politicians stand up, some preachers stand up, a scientist stand up and say, My words, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And yet, the Lord Jesus makes that statement. It's a stunning claim that Christ would say that. And uh, some would say, Well, no, wait, what makes his words any different from anyone else's? Well, simply this. He's God and we're not. And there's the difference. And unfortunately, some people don't recognize that about the Lord Jesus. And so they discount this statement in this 33rd verse. Or they take offense at it. But really, it doesn't matter the opinions of people, whether they accept this or not, because Jesus made this statement over 2,000 years ago. And His Word not only exists today, His Word impacts people around the world to change their lives, to improve their lives. It can change society. It, it can change families. It changes the individual. Well, secondly, here's what I want to think about today. What should be viewed as the words of Jesus? I want you to think about that. What should be viewed as the words of Jesus? Now, here's what some would say. The standard answer would be, the Gospels, what's written in the Gospels. Now, I don't have a red-letter edition, but I remember I have one in my office. This one's not. But I remember being told as a little boy when all those, those words written in red, those are the words of Jesus. Well, that's true. That is true. The words written in the Gospels, the words written in red, those are the words of Jesus. But if you limit and say, those are the words of Jesus, and nothing else, then you're sadly mistaken because you're limiting what the Bible actually teaches. The Bible makes this statement. Look in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, in verse 16. It says in this passage, All Scripture is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But it says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Now, some would say, they'd emphasize, well, it says right there, it's God-breathed. And that's true. Absolutely correct. But then they would, they would come and say, well, now wait, it says God-breathed. It doesn't say Jesus breathed. It says God breathed. And the problem there, they make a distinction between God and Jesus. And I want you to think about that for a second. Do you do that same thing in your own life? You read that, you make, you make the distinction. Well, God, God breathed. God inspired the words of the Bible without ever thinking about Jesus. And you make this clear distinction between God and Jesus. And that's a mistake that you should not make because the God spoken of is Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And when it says with God, in those days, those kings, if one was shorter than the other, they'd put pillars under that shorter one so that when he looked at the other king, they'd be eye to eye showing their equality. So when it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, he's showing equality. But then it says this, the Word was God. And then it says in 
chapter 1 of John's gospel in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only one referred to like that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it identifies Him as the Word, and it says the Word was God. He is God. And so when you think about Jesus making this statement in Luke chapter 21, verse 33, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. They'll never pass away. It means more than just the Gospels, because all the words of the Scripture should be considered to be His words. And you think, well, now, that doesn't make sense to me, because when in the world did He ever speak in the Old Testament? Well, let's just look over here in John's Gospel in the 8th chapter, and look what he says to some religious leaders. John, in chapter 8, in verse 45, Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, I, I, Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Then he says this, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Well, that's rather remarkable, isn't it? He'd stand before people and say, hey, you're welcome, go ahead. Can any of you reprove me of sin? Can you point out sin in my life? Well, they couldn't do it. He said, if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God believes and hears what God says. He hears what God says. Now, Jesus is chastising them because they're not listening to him. And he says, the one who belongs to God, because these Pharisees have been saying, oh, God's our Father, we belong to him. Jesus said, no, that's not true. And he says, the one who does belong to God hears what God says. He's identifying himself as God right there. I'm speaking to you and you're not listening to me. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Well, then come on down the page and notice the comments that Christ made. It says in verse 48, the Jews answered him, said, Aren't we right in saying that you are Samaritan and you're demon-possessed? And Jesus said, Well, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Well, then the Jews, they, they just got all over them. They, they exclaimed, that means they're just... They're overwhelmed with this remark. They said, now we know that you're demon-possessed. We know you're out of your mind saying something like that. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are, Jesus? And he said, well, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. He said, my father whom you claim is your God is the one who glorifies me. Then come down and look what it says here in verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And they said to him, you're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. And at this now, they don't want to talk anymore. Now they want to just kill him. And so it says they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. But he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to, to see my day. And you think, well, when in the world did Jesus Christ ever talk to Abraham? Well, let's just come over here in Genesis chapter 18 and take a look at that. Genesis chapter 18. Look what it says in verse 1. What are the evidences that Jesus Christ is declaring this truth in the Old Testament times? Well, here's one prime example. It says in the first verse, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of the tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. Now I'm going to show you that two of these men are angels. I'll show you that in just a second. But an angel will not let you do this. 
They will not let you bow before them. When that's done in the book of Revelation, John fell down before an angel twice who was giving him a statement on different occasions. And both times the angel said, Get up. You worship only God. But here are three. There's this third one. And it says, Abraham bowed to the ground. Nobody told him to get up. And he said, if I've found favor in your eyes, my Lord. And notice he just refers to one of them. Do not pass your servant by. Remember that song, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. They get that from this statement right here. He said, let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and go on your way now that you've come to your servant. Now look, very well, they answered. All three answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and quick, he said, get three sieves of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And while they ate, he stood near them. Where is your wife, they said, all three. Well, they're in the tent, he said, but now look, now one talks. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Just one's talking there. And Sarah's listening at this, and Sarah laughs, it says in verse 12, because she was up in years, she thought, I'm worn out, my master is old, and now I'm going to have this pleasure, I'm going to get to have a child. And then again, it's just one talking. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah now is afraid. So she lied and said, oh, I didn't laugh. But he... Meaning the Lord said, yes, you did laugh. And then you come to verse 17. Then the Lord said to the other two that were with him, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I've chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. The Lord says, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great before me. Well, the men turned away and went towards Sodom. Now, who were those two men? Well, if you look over here in chapter 19 in verse 1, it says, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. There were two angels. Abraham just saw them as men, but they were two angels. And it says there that they left and they went on to Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And Abraham approached him and said, Lord, are you going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people? This is where Abraham starts negotiating. He says, if there are 50 righteous, and the Lord says to him, so if I find 50 righteous, I'll spare the whole place. He said, well, I don't want to impose on you, but what about this? What if there's 45? He said, if I find 45, I'll spare it all. What about 40? I'll spare it. What about 35? 30, 25, 20, 15. Lord, 10. What if I find 10? He said, if I find 10, just 10 righteous, I'll spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, here's my question to you. That one that is referred to as the Lord there, who is that? I'll tell you, that's not an exalted angel. Who is that? That's the pre-incarnate Christ. Too many people live with the notion that Jesus Christ didn't come into existence until he was conceived in his mother's womb and then came forth in the Bethlehem experience. That is just so untrue. Jesus Christ is the eternal God who has always been and always will be. And when he makes these statements in Luke 21, verse 33, he says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You need to understand, the words of Jesus are not just the words written in red in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the whole of Scripture. 
When it says God breathed, that means Jesus breathed. This is the pre-incarnate Christ speaking to Abraham. So many people have no clue. They attend church every week. They have no clue. There are people that look at the Old Testament and say, well, the Old Testament... You know, that's a different deal. I'll just look at the New Testament because that's just the words of Jesus. So is the Old Testament. All of it. Now let me give you another example. When Jesus spoke, look over here in 1 Peter chapter 3. My focus class had a little discussion on this. And it was taught in a Sunday school class. 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 18. And it says this, 1 Peter, the third chapter in the 18th verse, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Not water baptism, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, and submission to Him. Powerful statements in there, but especially this one right here where it says this. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. All right, now what happens when somebody dies? When somebody dies, their spirit continues to live. They're either in the presence of God or they're in Hades. Hades is not the eternal hell, but it is a place. No one is in eternal hell right now. It's a place of torment. It's like a holding cell until the day of judgment. And when it says... He went to preach to those in prison. Some people say this. I mean, it's been taught in the church for years. They'd say, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, then he goes to torment and he preaches to the people in torment. Some even said this. Jesus, after he died on the cross, had to go to hell to suffer for our sin. That is just so false. Jesus' last words, right before he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, he said, it is finished. When he said that, he paid for the sins of the world on the cross. He didn't have to go to any eternal torment. He would paid for it, and he certainly didn't go there. He says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I'm coming to you. He said to the thief dying next to him, Today you'll be with me in paradise. That thief wasn't going to go to torment. He'd repented he was going to be where the Lord was, in paradise, in heaven. So what in the world does this mean? Some who would say, well, he went down there and he preached. Then I'm I'm going, well, what would he preach to them about? Because he couldn't offer them an invitation. There's no second chance once you leave this world. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you think after I die, somehow, some way, I'll have a chance, and then I can give my life to him. No, you can't. So what would he have said to them? And then why would he just limit it to those in the days of Noah? Why would he just go speak to those people? Because there's scores of other people in that place of torment. So that makes no sense. So when was Christ doing this? It says this. Look at it, please. He's put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits now in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. When did he go and speak to them? Well, he went in the days of Noah. Noah preached for 120 years. Who do you think was declaring the message of God through Noah to the people? And all those years, 120 years of preaching, urging them to repent, it was the pre-incarnate Christ. He's speaking then. So ladies and gentlemen, listen. We need to have a fresh understanding on this little statement that Jesus makes just so very brief and short and yet so wondrously powerful and gives us such great information. He says this, just understand, heaven and earth 
All things that exist will pass away. But he said, my words, my words will never pass away. That means his word doesn't just exist while we're in this world. When it's all gone and all changed, one thing that's going to be in heaven and in eternity forever is the word of Christ, the word of God. And when I know that and think of that, listen, how in the world can I put this on a shelf and never look at it? Let it be a dust collector. Never live by it. I'm going to make decisions in life based on how I feel or what seems to be the norm for the culture of the day. When I've got God, Jesus, speaking to me throughout his word, telling me, giving me direction about how to live, how to think, how to react, how to pray, how to serve. Why would I put this on the shelf and never read it? Listen, as a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, one commitment of life that you should make and stick to, not just for one year of your life, but for every day of your life, is that, Lord, your word, your word, I'm going to read, and I'm going to treasure it, and I'm going to hide it in my heart. King David, who had all that power, King David's life for a period of time was out of control. King David's life only got in control when he began to really take the word of God. He says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. If you don't hide it, don't treasure it, don't let it be a living part of you, boy, you just get into anything you can imagine. But you let this word be a part of your life. It can change your life, the direction of your life, the way you think, the way you act, the way you live. Talk about a better world. The world would be transformed instantaneously if people would come to Christ and take his word to heart. But listen, I just want you to know today, when you think about the Bible, I hope you take these verses we looked at this morning and you just come to understand that statement that he makes in Luke 21, verse 33, it applies to the whole of the Bible. What are the words of Jesus? The whole Bible. The whole Bible. Let's bow for prayer. Well, Father, I just pray it could give a fresh understanding to all of us of the importance of reading your word, memorizing your word, letting this word dwell within us. And, Father, way too many of us, we can sit in here, we can come into church on a regular weekly basis and yet, Lord, never look at your word. And I pray for students. I pray for adults. I pray for senior adults. Lord, if we can't read it, help us to get it on some tape where we can listen to it or a cassette where we can listen to it. But, Father, help us to know that when we're looking at the Bible, that, Lord Jesus, it's not just the words of men. These are men inspired by you. Lord Jesus, they're your words. Help us to take it as such. And Father, I just pray for people in this room that have never trusted in you as their Savior. The Lord, they'd realize that, that your word says there's only one way that a person can have life that's everlasting and forgiveness of their sins. And Lord Jesus, that's through you. They must give their life to you. And I pray your spirit just in this moment takes that right to their heart. And Lord, help them to realize the importance of saying yes to you and giving their lives to you. And Lord, we just pray for any other decision for you that needs to be made. You may be calling somebody in here to some special service. You may be calling a young person to some ministry. Who knows? But Lord, whatever decision people need to make, help them respond to your calling. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, in just a moment we're going to be dismissed. But after we're dismissed, I'll be standing right here at the front. And if you've never trusted in the Lord as your personal Savior, you can do that right now. This is our invitation to you. We just invite you. You just get up and make your way right down here to the front. As soon as we're finished, you just come down here. There will be some others down here with me. We'd be more than happy to share with you how you can meet Jesus Christ. And think of that. You can meet the eternal Christ right now, right today. If you'd like to make that commitment, we sure hope you'll come. You might be a believer and you're thinking about Meadowood as a church home, you have questions about that, or maybe you've already made the decision, we want to join here. We want to place our lives here in serving. 
If that's true, you please come and express that, and we'll tell you how you can be a part here at Meadowood.